Hi there, everyone, and welcome back to NYU Game Center's lecture series. Um, I'm Maddie, and I'm so excited to be here today. Um, even if it's virtually, it's still together. Um, so I am incredibly excited for our talk today um, by um, both, uh, it's gonna be a co-talk with Andy Wallace and Ramsey Nasser. And I've known both for quite some time. I feel like um, we started to meet each other in uh, indie circles, I wanna say, maybe at an indie kid or different games between, between the coast and all over. And um, when, I, when I was thinking about um, this introduction, I was like, okay, well, what, what do I say about these two? Um, and what kind of came to my mind was they're always kind of up to something, <laughs> like always up to something really interesting. Every single time I met them, it was something new. Um, and what I really like about both of them is how much uh, both experimental games practice and community engagement and collaboration is central to both of their practices. And so I think uh, these uh, qualities are really important when we're thinking about some larger issues in games today. Um, so over the past year or so, we've had a lot of conversation in the industry about labor. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, labor organizing, protests, um, news around and lawsuits about workplace um, uh, contexts. And we've discussed a lot of that here at the Game Center and in our town halls and in our classes. Um, and we even um, have a, a graduate seminar on co-op. So shout out to my co-op class kids out there. Um, and so this is really important. And I'm, I feel like this is such a fitting and important talk to talk about. Um, so they will be uh, talking about their um, cooperative Emma, and it's actually also going to be new to me because this is um, a recent development, and I think this will be a good thing for everyone who is considering alter labor alternatives and how to get started because they did, and they're here to kind of share their experiences. So that's enough from me. I'm going to hand this over to Andy and Ramsey. All right, hi there. Thank you so much for having us today. Thank you for that intro, Maddie. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's very sweet. It's wild to think about how long we've all been making games and various scenes. <laughs> yeah, that was a, a wonderful introduction. And I'm happy that I'm thought of as someone who's always up to something, which is uh, something I maybe like etched on my tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. So yeah, today uh, we're going to be talking about forming a creative code and technology cooperative. Uh, just like Maddie was saying, there's, uh, I don't know, there's lots of exciting ways you can potentially like, do business and ways that feel good to you and align with the stuff you care about. So hopefully this will be useful to you um, or at least, you know, interesting. <coughs> I apologize. Okay. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about who we are. Uh, so there's two of us here, but there's also two of us not here. So hi, I'm Andy Wallace. Oh. Sorry, I mistimed that. Uh, I'm Ramsey Nasser. <laughs> and then uh, not here is Gwen Pascarello and Ivan Safran. And all together, we are Emma. Uh, so we are all members of the Emma Technology Cooperative, a worker-owned creative technology studio that is pretty new. We are only a few months old. Uh, we are became official as of January 1st, although the process of building towards that has been going on for quite a bit longer. Um, so just to give you a sense of kind of what our deal is, it's nice to know the people who are in front of you. Hi, my name is Andy. We've said that like six times so far. We'll probably do it once or twice more. Uh, here's some websites where you can find me. There's Twitter. There's also Mastodon. Mastodon's been blowing up lately. Who knows why, uh, but that's been kind of fun. And uh, so I'm a game designer and a creative coder. I was a professor for a while. Uh, I got my MFA in design and technology from Parsons. So I love NYU dearly, but uh, you know, Parsons is kind of, kind of always be the thing. Uh, and I've done a number of things. I worked at a studio called Golden Ruby Games. It was this really small studio on the 77th floor of the Empire State Building. It's a very interesting experience. 
Uh, I taught at Long Island University for a while. And in 2013, I co-founded Death by Audio Arcade, uh, a group dedicated to making new arcade games in public spaces. You can see me here with my baby Particle Mace, one of the older machines in the collection, which you can really tell uh, just from looking at it. This machine has fallen down a lot of times, but it keeps working, which is exciting. Uh, I make all sorts of video games. But I have a special love for experimental and especially like physical games. Um, I like arcade games, but I also like just like weird objects you interact with. Uh, this is a game I worked on with Juno Moro called Circumnavigators, where there's these strips of LEDs around it and the players have to literally run around the thing trying to like chase their kind of light and they press these buttons. It's a lot of fun. Overall, I like big, exciting experiences. Often this is video games, but it can also just be like interesting social interactions. Uh, this is a truck I helped Jason Epink and Larissa Hayden make for the Lost Horizon Night Market called the Machiavellian Cheese Truck. This is a U-Haul truck that we decorated. People would go in and they would have to like grovel before the prince to get mac and cheese. It was a whole mechanic where they could dethrone them. It's fun. Generally speaking, the more cumbersome and impossible to market, like the more I like an interaction. Uh, and then I also make a lot of procedural art. Lately, this has mostly been about using a pen plotter. So I write C++ code to control an articulated arm. But uh, I also really enjoy making tweet carts, like little sort of demo scene visualizations that are in 280 characters or less. All right, that's like a lightning fast overview of my practice. I'm going to hand it to Ramsey for a second. Uh, hi. Um, so I'm, I'm Ramsey. Uh, this, these are some places you can uh, find me online. Um, Posting more and more on Merve, which is my Mastodon instance, but I'm uh, on on Twitter uh, for now. We'll, we'll see. We'll see where that goes. <laughs> um, yeah, you want to go to the next slide? So um, <clears throat> I make all kinds of things, uh, sort of all over the place. Uh, and in my, to my mind, it all sort of comes from the same place. It's like the same sort of energy that's driving it, but but it is a little scatter shot. Uh, I make games, uh, digital art, recently uh, electronic music, uh, computer science research, programming language, compiler stuff. Um, but really sort of playfulness is something that I'm just like continue to be drawn to and to continue to sort of, you know, make life rich. Um, this is a photo of uh, me and a longtime collaborator, Kaho Abe, prototyping a game called Selfie Deathmatch, which you don't have time to get into, unfortunately. Um, so uh, in addition to like making uh, uh, games and, and playful experiences, I'm, I'm very uh, interested in like what it actually means to make um, uh, games and playful experiences and, and who gets to do that and who doesn't. Um, so my native language is, is, is Arabic uh, and it's not lost on me that all programming is done in, in English. Um, so starting in 2013 at IBEAM, uh, I've been doing research and art um, around the cultural assumptions that are baked into computing. Um, and the sort of flagship project there is a programming language called ELB, uh, which is a programming language that is entirely in my native uh, Arabic um, that you can actually use on a computer. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, the Fibonacci uh, sequence algorithm uh, done as a, uh, in the style of a 12th century um, Iraqi tile mosaic. So that's the source code of the, the, the Fibonacci uh, algorithm. Um, but, but like I said, it's, it's, and I know this is, this is a, this is a talk at, at the game center and, and, and games are, are really central to, to my practice and, and, and my profession, which we've got to get into, um, a lot of what I do, uh, for myself or for, for work, it tends to be games or game like systems or playful systems. Um, as a developer, I find them, uh, th to present the most interesting challenges compared to like other software, because you have to manage time, uh, you have to manage state across time, but you also have to build systems that you can iterate on, right? You have to build, write your software in a way that you can sort of make massive changes at a whim. Um, and I just love the puzzles that that, that, that presents. So, so I, I, I keep doing it. This is a game called Han Vaska uh, that I made in 2017 with a collaborator, Jane Friedhoff. It was about beating up fascists. Uh, that, was, that was dope. Uh, and, and finally, um, I'm part of the Live Code NYC Collective. This is a group of, of nerds who write software on stage to produce music and visuals. Um, 
this is uh, I, I've, I've, and I've done both. Uh, this is a, a clip of me using a tool I made called Fixels to do the visuals uh, while my uh, collaborator, Tom Murphy, um, was, was like making music that you can't hear in this clip. Um, so all over the place, but that's, that's, the, that's the kind of stuff that, that, that I'm generally up to, uh, to use Maddie's words. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, we're good to go. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I hope my, my slide placement was good for you there. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. So that's just a, a little bit kind of what we do in general. Um, and it's maybe interesting to note that we like didn't really talk a lot about work as part of like how we identify ourselves. Um, and that's gonna probably come up with a bit more. So here's what we're talking about today. Uh, obviously we're talking about our cooperative, Emma, but we want to kind of go through a few different points to how we got there and how it's all working. Um, so we're gonna talk about the personal paths that got us here, our high level goals going into it, why we wanted this structure, what we wanted out of it, how Emma works kind of on a conceptual level, what we wanted to do in terms of making it happen, and then how Emma works on a practical level. Like how did we actually make this thing real? Like how do we have something that is recognized by the state? Um, we wanna talk a little bit about the benefits of being a cooperative, because why go through all this work? If there's no reason to do it. Uh, and then finally, we're just going to end with some advice that might be useful if you're trying to start a co-op, might just be useful if you're trying to behave in a more cooperative way. Uh, I wanted to start with just a few disclaimers, which is that every co-op is different. Every co-op is special. They are all the, your own little unique snowflake. Uh, we can only speak to our experience. Our experience isn't going to be your experience. And we can talk about what we've done and how we got here. But ultimately, this isn't a guide. Uh, this is an example. There's a million ways to go about doing these kind of things, and we only know our own. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as a special note, um, we specifically are a service co-op, meaning that we provide a service as opposed to a product. And this gives us some leeway that a lot of other types of businesses might not necessarily have. Specifically, our overhead costs were real low and our startup costs pretty minimal. Um, compare this to, say, a construction company or a video game studio, that has like a lot of initial costs that needs to happen. So we've had some freedom there. And we also just have the benefit of we are working within an economic system that all of us had experience with beforehand. Emma's very new, but we've all done this kind of freelance work before. So that's kind of the domain where we have knowledge. If you want to talk to us about like other industries, we'll, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> we probably won't really know. OK, so how do we get to Emma? There's four of us here and we all have worked other jobs and now we are kind of coming together to build this uh, co-op together. Uh, from my own experience, uh, I was working at Golden Ruby Games, I mentioned earlier, way up top on the Empire State Building and I was making things I cared about. It was really exciting being there. It was a small company. I was the lead programmer and designer, um, but it was also really, really exhausting um, because I was making things I cared about, but I also was making things that like had to sell. And if they don't sell enough, I don't have money. Uh, the company dies, like it's bad. Uh, and that was exhausting. After that, I went to Long Island University. I love teaching. I love the faculty there and I love the students there. It was really great. And it was like very cool to work with people in that way and very fulfilling. But I also wound up quitting partially because of the administration response to COVID. Uh, and it was very frustrating for me to have so many decisions about my livelihood made without my actual input. Um, but during this time, both at Golden Ruby and at Long Island University, I maintained a personal practice. Like Maddie says, it's always getting up to something. Um, some of this was freelance. Some of this was making my own games that can't possibly make money. Some of this was like making art. Um, and so when I left Long Island University, my partner had been talking to Ramsey sort of about just getting started with this co-op. And although she ultimately took a different gig somewhere else, um, that's kind of how I got pulled into this orbit. Uh, Renzi, you want to talk a little bit about how you got here? Sure. Um, so I've been freelancing in some capacity doing uh, creative coding work um, since about 2010, I'd say, since grad school. Um, it's wild that it's been over a decade at this point. Um, but uh, Co-ops weren't really on my radar until uh, 2017, when a co-op that we'll talk a little bit about in, 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 a, in a minute, uh, a co-op called Field Train, very generously published all of their organizational documents and were very uh, explicit about how they formed, kind of doing what we're doing today, um, but they did it back in 2017. 
And that got me thinking about ways, uh, different ways to sort of, um, you know, try and make the work that I do more sustainable. Um, so I was trying to find, yeah, so I was trying to find ways to, to continue to support myself and, and do work that I cared about. Uh, I ran a, a company based on an open source uh, project of mine that got some investment money uh, in, in 2018. Um, I taught as an adjunct um, and you know, I, I, I applied for some full-time teaching positions, but nothing quite clicked. Uh, and honestly, it was the, the Lebanese revolution in 2019 and my involvement with it um, that I had a sort of what am I doing with my life moment. And um, I, I just felt the sort of like need to try and commit to try and build something that um, didn't just approximate my principles, but like really sort of uh, uh, like live those principles. So um, I quit everything around then to, to start really seriously thinking about uh, uh, set, setting up a cooperative. Yeah, and so going into it, I mean, that's how uh, Ramsey and I got here, but Gwen and Ivan, you know, kind of similar paths. Uh, and so the four of us really had overlapping personal goals that just kind of dictated what we wanted to get out of a co-op. Uh, and so these, these four bullet points are probably the like main principles <laughs> behind everything we're doing here. And like all the other rules and things just kind of extrapolate out from this. Um, but we had, you know, we had to think about like what we wanted out of an organization and what we wanted out of our professional lives. And the main things were, we wanted to make enough money to live comfortably while having time to make art. Um, everyone in this group has a personal art practice. We wanna be able to make art while like getting food and like a place to live, that kind of thing, and living comfortably. Uh, and comfortably means different things to different people. So we wanted to be able to support kind of different versions of that as well. Um, we did not want to depend on art to make a living. Uh, I've had my fill of that personally. Uh, I find it really exhausting and it kind of sucks the fun out of things. Um, so I want to be able to, you know, count on something else to actually make a living. Uh, and whoever we're working for, some of that excess money is going to go to them. I mean, we're still generating profit for clients, hopefully. <laughs> uh, but at least with our own org, we want to know that the money is going to a structure that we value. Uh, as opposed to working for a studio or someplace else where that might not be the case. Uh, Co-op's not the only way to guarantee this, but it was our approach. And finally, and this is like kind of lowest on the totem pole, honestly, is that doing interesting work is a big plus, but honestly, not strictly required. Uh, it's fun to program a computer. We're a group of people who just like enjoy that just for its own sake. Um, and often that can be interesting even if the end product is not. So we generally reject actively harmful work, but sometimes if we're plumbers in digital toilets, that's fine if it achieves these other goals. Um, we were inspired by other co-ops, which is not shocking. Um, these are all folks worth checking out. So Ramsey already mentioned Field Train. Uh, they're a creative tech web-focused co-op that closed doors in 2019, unfortunately, but uh, they shared their documents, their incorporation documents, bylaws, et cetera, and they annotated them really, really well. So just wildly useful resource in addition to just like a cool group of people doing interesting work. Um, there's, of course, Co-op, the uh, video game studio up in Canada. Really got ahead on that name. Um, soft But Not Weak, sorry, Soft Not Weak, uh, video game studio in Portland and Motion Twin, a video game studio in France. Uh, even if we are not necessarily doing games as a co-op, you can tell sort of where influences are. So hopefully this talk makes sense here. Um, but yeah, well, one of the things that really got us along this path, and I think Ramsey especially, is that we just saw co-ops created by other people we knew, other people whose work we respected. And we thought like, oh, cool, there's something there. Uh, and of course, there were just like experiences that made it attractive to us, especially the experience of collaboration. Uh, I'm sure everyone watching the stream has had really positive experiences, either at school or in game jam, uh, on open source projects. Uh, and just like, how can we recreate that experience where it's like really just like exciting and dynamic when you're working with someone and you're in a good flow with that? Um, how can we like make that happen as much as possible? And of course, on the flip side, you're just like, bad professional experiences that, again, I'm sure everyone here has had, just like inefficient or toxic corporations, um, you know, kind of giving us a sense of the structures we did not want to mimic. Okay, so all of that brings us to, uh, thank you, Ramsey, Emma. So 
Emma Technology Cooperative. We've been in the process of getting it off the ground for over a year now. And as of this past January, we are a legally recognized co-op in New York State. Uh, we are billing and being paid via the co-op. All the members, this is now their main source of income. So far, we've had six clients, 27 invoices, 13 of which have cleared. I'm confident the rest will clear since there's sometimes a delay on these things. Uh, by the way, this is not our real logo. Uh, we have not done a branding pass just yet. Uh, a lot of other stuff to get sorted. <laughs> We're all programmers. That's really what it comes down to. <laughs> Uh, do want to take a moment just to mention our other two members, uh, like we said earlier, in addition to us, there's Ivan and Gwen, just to give a quick little bit of background on them. Uh, Gwen, for instance, is a truly amazing live coder and just kind of all around server person. Uh, this is a live code piece running on a portable analog TV, like an old Walkman TV. Uh, it's an HDMI to composite adapter connected to a mid 80s video sender that is broadcasting this signal just to her Walkman, uh, which rules. <laughs> so, uh, and then Ivan has just tons and tons of experience uh, creating shaders and other kind of seemingly impossible things for folks. This is Deep City, a three-part installation at Google's headquarters in New York, uh, which is designed and built by Hush. And Ivan was the lead creative technologist on this project. Sorry, I'm like looking at it in my other screen there. Okay, so what is Emma? Um, none of us are named Emma and it's uh, there's four of us, but it's not just like the letters of our name. So kind of goes up in the air. Emma might be an acronym. It could mean everybody making money in art, uh, but it is definitely an homage to Emma Goldman, uh, who is a badass anarchist who did a lot of her work in New York City in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, so. Yeah, want to give a shout out there. Cool. So that's kind of an overview of who we are going into it. And also just like we get to like throw a little bit of confetti up because Emma's a real thing. But uh, <laughs> yeah, let's, um, let's talk about what the actual goals of the organization are. So we knew the sort of things we wanted going into it, like as individuals, what we found valuable. But then we have to start thinking about what the org is actually gonna to do to achieve those things. Um, so some of what we really wanted out of Emma is one thing to act as a financial capacitor. Rams is gonna break down exactly what that means in a minute, but that was kind of the linchpin of the whole conversation at first. But then also to support each other's processes, to minimize our work and to stay small, um, which is, kind of an interesting thing for any kind of organization in a capitalist system, uh, but we'll get into it. First though, let's uh, talk about this financial capacitor. Yeah, so like Andy said, uh, the financial capacitor was um, when we were still gathering the, uh, the lineup uh, that we currently have and, and you know, uh, talking to each other about what um, we might want. Uh, this is the thing that stood out the most um, as something that we could do in a co-op. Um, this is a totally made up concept by us. Uh, if you bring this up to an accountant, they're going to look at you weird because it's like sort of not a thing. Um, but it is, uh, it's a way of using something that we all kind of understand, which is electronics, to explain something that we don't, which is money. Um, so people who haven't dabbled in electronics, a capacitor is an, elect an electronic device that can store a charge of electricity and then discharge it slowly. Uh, it's kind of like a weird battery. It's not exactly a battery, but that's sort of the idea. It could sort of accumulate charge and then dissipate that charge uh, over time. Uh, so in this graph uh, on, on the slide, the dotted line is an input voltage. It's electricity coming into the capacitor. Uh, and the solid line is the capacitor's output. So when there's you know, power coming in, they're the same. But when the power drops off, the capacitor basically dissipates its charge slowly. So. Um, something we all experience as freelance um, creative coders is that uh, this line of work has, has booms and busts. Uh, there are periods where there's a lot of work, there's like almost too much work uh, and it pays quite well. Uh, but then, you know, I've gone a year without a contract, right? Uh, in, in, or, or more sometimes, I think like, like a year and a half was the worst. Um, 
So in our minds, that's kind of like the input signal, right? We have this like this really, really big seasons. And then, you know, you, you don't know, you know, you might be facing a gulf of an indeterminate size. So the idea of a financial capacitor is to build an organization where we can pool our resources during the, the booms uh, so that we can continue to pay salaries during, during the busts. Uh, it's a pretty simple idea, but like uh, that, that's, that's, that's basically all it is. Um, the other aspect to it too is that um, you know when there's more than one person uh, uh, charging this capacitor, so to speak, um, you know, the odds of any one of us not having a gig is you know some percentage, but the odds of all four of us being out of work is actually quite low. Um, so this, this is one of the ways that Emma allows us to take care of each other, where um, at, statistically speaking, someone that's, that's going to be charging the capacitor at any point in time. Um, so these are ways that like joining a co-op uh, for the four of us made more sense than uh, uh, you could potentially make more sense financially than continuing to do this the same kind of work on our own. Yeah, totally. I, uh, I dig the capacitor chat in the, the chat also. Like, good deal. <laughs> um, so yeah, the whole the capacitor was kind of what got us to the table, but then as we talked about it more, um, there were other things we really want. So one of them is just supporting the members' processes. Like I said, we all have artistic processes that we care about, um, which by and large don't have any potential to make money and that's sort of how we like it. And so one of the things we can do is we can prop each other up in that way too, um, both by providing some security in the form of the capacitor, but also just that we have varied skills and interests and we're good at different things and we can help each other out in that way. Um, so although Emma's financial reason to exist is to do freelance creative code, we want to make sure that all the members of Emma can actually produce things that are not marketable, marketable or even market hostile uh, in which they find artistically rewarding. Another big one for us is to minimize work. We do not dream of labor. We want to live enough to work comfortably. And then when possible, we would like to stop working. Uh, working less is an explicit goal of our co-op, and we want our members to be able to pursue projects that they find valuable for their own sake, in addition to projects that they find valuable because you know, it keeps the light on in their apartment. Uh, knowing when to stop working or start turning down work when you're solo can be really difficult. Uh, like Ramsey was just saying, you have boom and bust periods, and it can, be, it can feel dangerous to turn down work because you're not sure when that bust period is going to happen. But hopefully, if we have a capacitor and we can have a little more security, all our members are more able to sort of make those decisions for themselves about when it's safe to turn down work. Another thing we want is to stay small. We don't have an exact number, but Emma will always remain small, most likely fewer than eight people. Um, this size is actually made very explicit in field trains bylaws, and like they set a hard number on it. Uh, we chose not to do that for Emma, but as we get into the governance of the org, it's going to become pretty obvious that it can only work with a small number of members. We value consensus decision making, and it just doesn't scale beyond a large group. Furthermore, it's important to us that all our members know and respect each other. Um, not in a like general, be nice to each other, be polite on Slack uh, way, but in a way that really requires everyone knowing each other and like having a reasonably good sense of like what their practice is about, what kind of things they're doing uh, that kind of can only happen with a small group. All right. Yeah, so they're like, um, there's a different kind of scaling that I think we're interested in. Um, and uh, we don't dream of a, big giant co-op um, but uh, instead a, a, a world or an industry made out of many many co-ops small co-ops all of which are self-managing uh, tailored to their own respective members needs like we said every co-op will be a little different and in the same way that we tailored Emma to our needs um, in this you know the the sort of bigger version of this is you have many many other co-ops tailored to, to their own needs um, these co-ops would collaborate, right? We'd, we'd sort of help each other out. We'd exchange knowledge. We'd, we'd support each other. Um, and then potentially build bigger structures out of that. Um, and this is a diagram from, uh, the, that you'll see in a lot of anarcho-syndicalist um, um, uh, you know, theory and, and, and writing 
uh, of the general idea of how to structure an entire society based, based on this. So, so there's a lot of precedent for, for this kind of uh, organization and structure. And in this, in this uh, diagram, uh, Emma would be at the very bottom of the list, it's one of many self-managed workplaces that could potentially send delegates up to a syndicate, which then federate. Um, so, so many, many small co-ops is, is, is the dream as opposed to one, one big Emma, which uh, as Andy said, is, it not, is a sort of an inversion of, of the way um, you're encouraged to think under capitalism, which is you make whatever you're doing as big as possible and, and you know, absorb everything else. That's not what we want. Cool. So, all right, those are our goals. Now, starting to get a little bit more into the nuts and bolts, although not quite the like governmental nuts and bolts. Um, it's like, well, how do we make that happen? Those are all like really nice goals. I, I think everyone's into working less, uh, at least deep down, even if they don't like say it. <laughs> um, so how do we do that for us? Like how does Emma actually work? So there's kind of two lenses on how Emma works. We have our internal conceptual model for the co-op. Um, and then how this model is actually encoded and implemented in the legal structures that like we have to live under that are encoded by the state. Um, so Emma is a software consultancy that uses consensus governance and a proportional compensation structure. Uh, we all make the decisions and we get paid relative to how much we work. In Emma, there is no difference between a founding and future member. We only have one class of member. If you are part of Emma, you are that class of member. Uh, and to keep things on the rails, we rotate responsibilities and we very, very actively stay in touch with each other. So mentioned earlier, we write software. We are all programmers, game designers, creative technologists, really whatever kind of label you put on it, we write code at the end of the day. Uh, so our members engage clients on a contractual basis. The work tends to revolve around interactive software. So video games, graphics, public installations, AR, VR. Um, frankly, we're open to just about anything within our skill set. For instance, Ramsey has done work on one compiler contract, um, something I would never, ever touch. <laughs> but at its core, a software consultancy is not a remarkable idea. Uh, like I said earlier, it does make us a service company and not a product company, which keeps us very capital light. The investment is pretty low. We have our laptops, which I almost picked up to gesture at you, and then I realized that uh, you can't see it. It's the camera. <laughs> um, but there's no need for us to invest a ton of money to start making money. I mean, we have to have computers. All of us already had computers. Um, and that this is a type of economics that we all have some experience with, and as a result, understand a little bit. Um, Ramsey wanted me to mention that at a gold rush, you don't dig for gold, you sell shovels. And that's kind of where we're coming at. We're not like trying to sell the software. We are just, someone has some software they want to have made. Cool, we'll make it for you. So that's how we sort of interact with clients. That's what we're offering, that's the service there. But then we have to actually run this cooperative. We have to make decisions. Uh, and we use consensus governance. Uh, we don't vote. Uh, we do not use votes on fixed proposals. It's a conversation. It, uh, we all have to agree to do something. And this is different from a unanimous vote. It isn't the same as just like, do we want to do this? Everyone raises their hand and says they do, but one person doesn't. So, okay, fine, we don't do it. Um, that's still a really binary thing, whereas this is very deliberately a conversation. Uh, if there's a proposal on the table, you can have a spectrum of responses all the way from like, I love it, to, well, this is okay, to... I hate this and I'm leaving. Like this is like the direction we're going is just fundamentally incompatible with me. Fingers crossed it doesn't happen, but you know, it's not just, yes, I support it. No, I don't. Um, and the proposals often change over the course of this conversation. Um, when describing this to people, it strikes a lot of folks as pretty unusual. Frankly, it struck me as a little unusual when we started kind of bringing it up. But honestly, it's pretty straightforward. The actual method here is kind of the same as like if you're trying to choose where to go to dinner with friends. Um, you usually don't just like put it up to a vote and then when one person doesn't like it, like, I don't know, maybe you have a different friend group. Um, but it's important to note that this works because we're small. Um, if we got much bigger, this would become impossible. With 100 members, for instance, this just would not be viable because uh, it takes a while to hear everyone's opinion. 
And Ivan, uh, one of our members with extensive experience in consensus housing, uh, has described the process saying, it takes you longer to make decisions, but the quality of those decisions tend to be better. Uh, and there are a lot of groups that use things like this. Uh, even the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF, uses rough consensus in their decision making. Uh, one note here, the lawyers did not like it. Um, there's a lot of back and forth on this point when writing our bylaws with our lawyers. Uh, and it, this really kind of highlights how a lot of organizations is just assumed from the jump that they're designed for infinite growth. Like this is not a system that supports infinite growth. Um, we think it makes our decisions very effective and that we get good answers from them, but it means that, yeah, we can't really grow and the lawyers, yeah, kind of push back on that. But I think, think we got to sort it more on that in a minute. Um, so, uh, in our, our compensation, uh, we say that everyone is paid the same way. This is different from everyone is paid the same amount, which is what, uh, some co-ops do, which, um, when I was coming into co-ops, I assumed was a hard requirement, right? You just have to pay everyone the same. Um, it's, it's, it's not a, it's a totally valid thing to do. Um, but when everyone is paid the same amount, uh, it makes it difficult to support the different life needs of different members, right? If one member is taking care of family, for example, while other, mem other members are not, they may just need more money on hand. And if they're not empowered to, to make that money, that's, that's, a, that's a, a limitation. Um, so in our version, everyone is paid uh, by the same mechanism. There's, they're paid in the same way. And, and, and that's how we keep things fair. Uh, the current mechanism is uh, members keep 70% of whatever invoices they bring and, and clear uh, through the co-op. Um, and 30% uh, remains at EMMA, basically, to cover uh, uh, costs and, and future salaries. Um, so, so that's the first part, is you have a 70-30 a, a split between the members and, and the co-op. Um, the next part of that is that if a member happens to bring in less than a certain base salary that we decide by consensus uh, in, in a period, which is sort of the, the, the pay periods are months currently, uh, if you happen to bring in less, then you're just paid that base salary. So it's, it's a 70-30 split with a safety net uh, that will catch you if, if you have clients who are slow um, or if you're going through a period where maybe you're not invoicing, right? Maybe you're just bringing in zero, right? So this is a, a base salary that, that you'll be paid regardless of, of how much you work. Um, so this empowers people to who need to take on more work to bring in more money to support their own life situations. You're empowered to do that. You can engage more clients. You can take on more hours. That's totally cool. Um, but at the same time, people who don't want to do that or can't do that for whatever reason are not left in the dark, right? You have this, this base salary that, that'll, that'll catch you. Um, so uh, as I said, I really thought that paying everyone the same amount was, was crucial to uh, cooperative organizing, um, but I've come to understand that um, actually governing as equals, the, the uh, previous slide that Andy went through uh, uh, is, is so much more important than how people get paid. Um, you can imagine, and there have been organizations that pay people exactly the same, but the governance is not equal. There's still an owner who can make decisions and close the company if they decide that that's what they need to do. Um, and then that, that is not a cooperative, right? Um, so, so, so separating out the compensation from governance is, 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 was, was some of the learning that I had to do while, while forming Emma. Uh, and, and just a final note, uh, this is different from, a, from profit sharing. This is just basically how our salaries throughout the year get paid. Uh, profit sharing, uh, co-ops will have mechanisms to share the end of the year profits with their members, um, which is not this, uh, and not something we're really gonna talk about because we haven't encountered it because uh, we haven't uh, been around for more than a year. Um, but I just want to flag that as a, as a difference. Um, yeah, so, so this is a rough, just a sketch of the equation as we understand it. Um, keep it in mind because I'm gonna, uh, we're going to show a version of this as we sort of present it to the state because it's a little bit different, although it does the same thing. Totally. Uh, 
and then, yeah, another part of sort of making things feel equal in a way that made sense for us is that we have founders rights for all members. It's only one class of members. So everyone's a member, there's no hierarchy. And when other members join down the line, they'll be exactly equal to the founding members following a candidacy period. Not all co-ops are like this. Uh, it is not a legal requirement or even a theoretical one. The principles call for democratic member control, which could absolutely allow for hierarchy. Some co-ops have founders multipliers that increase the profit share of the founders permanently and things like that, but um, that was not right for us. So everyone's just the same across the board. It's me. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we share, uh, so some of the work is like Andy said, we all love programming computers. Um, and, uh, but there's also uh, boring things, unlike programming a computer <laughs> that, has to, that has to get done uh, to run a business. Um, so we share those responsibilities. Um, we, uh, right now it's just payroll is the sort of the day-to-day the -day, uh, or, or the, the, the regular occurring thing that has to happen that's kind of boring and, and, and rote. Uh, and we take turns running payroll, um, but while setting up, uh, while getting the co-op off the ground, you know, making runs to the post office to set up our um, our, our PO box, um, you know, dealing with the bank, all those sort of like un unfun things. Those are all responsibilities that we shared to, to the best of our ability. Um, and the sharing responsibilities is is more than just like a nice thing to do. Um, if you go to the next slide, Andy. Uh, there's a, um, uh, he's, he's basically, a, there's, a, there's a researcher named uh, Michael Albert. Um, he's basically an anarchist economist. I, I don't know that he's like self-identified that way, but that's, he's interested in non-state uh, economic systems. Um, he, I'm, I'm, I'm working through his, his most recent book, No Bosses right now. Um, and he asserts that sharing, um, the, uh, mixing empowering and, and non-empowering tasks is the language that he uses, is, is not just, um, again, like a nice thing to do. It actually makes your decision-making processes more robust. Um, so for us, by sharing payroll, everyone at Emma has had a chance to basically, we all do the books uh, and we've all seen the financial machinery that, that pays us out. So whenever we have to like make a decision about our finances, we're making that decision as a team of equals, which would not be the case if one of us was designated as the money person. And they now have dis a disproportionate amount of knowledge about an aspect of, of the, the, the organization relative to everyone else. So uh, Albert really, it's, it's, a, it's an argument that I like a lot, which is that you really do need to share in the tasks that, um, that, that, that sort of like govern the, the organizations that you're trying to build. And, and he has arguments that build off of that. So this is, this is uh, his work in, this, in general and this book in particular is I think worth, worth exploring. Cool. Um, so yeah, that's like how Emma works conceptually. Those are what we wanted the organizational structure to be for us internally and how we wanted to interact with it. Um, but uh, the state and other bodies need more than that, or they need something else from that. And so uh, we want to move on to just talking a little bit about how we set up Emma on a nuts and bolts level. Um, there's a million ways to do this. I think the exact goals and the things we wanted out of Emma could probably be written into law in several different ways. This is the approach we took. Um, some of these decisions we made because we already had some freedom that gave us more options, um, such as having like some cash on hand to get set up. Uh, and probably also a lot of these decisions will turn out to not necessarily be the best course of action. Uh, talk to us in a few years when we've had more than a few months of incorporation and maybe we'll tell you one or two things we did like, oh, we would do it a little differently. Um, but same disclaimer as before, this isn't a guide, it's an example for what we did. Um, so Ramsey, did you want to give a little overview on what it is on a technical level? Yeah. So as a legal entity, Emma is a New York State domestic worker cooperative corporation. Um, that it, it's already as a structure a little bit complex. It most resembles a C corporation, which is the kind of corporations that form in Delaware, 
like real corporations. Um, they, they are a, a legal entity separate from any of the people involved. They're taxed as, you know, they pay corporate uh, taxes. Um, so sort of out the gate, it's, it's a little more complicated, but New York State has a special kind of corporation that is a worker cooperative corporation. Um, this will vary from state to state, but um, uh, New York has good co-op laws. Um, at the federal level, we are what's called a T corporation, uh, which I put in quotes because it's not a, a, a formal term, um, but it, it relates to the fact that um, the more common S corporation gets its name from subchapter S of the IRS tax code. The next chapter, subchapter T, governs uh, how co-ops are taxed. Um, so we, we file a slightly different uh, tax form at the end of the year um, because we're a co-op and there's certain kinds of accounting that we're allowed to do uh, that, that other corporations are, are not allowed to do. Um, we also had to make the compensation structure that I described uh, work uh, within the laws of New York State. So as far as, as uh, the government is concerned, we pay, we compensate our, our members uh, a base salary plus commission. So um, that is the, it actually matches it quite well, um, but the, in terms of the pay structure, you have to, you kind of can't make, just make things up when it comes to uh, uh, paying people. Um, and, and this is a structure that already existed in, in New York State that, that, we, that we leaned on. Um, and then finally, um, we of course could not have done this alone and there's a, a slew of services and, and, um, uh, and, and tools that we, that we use to get started that we, we wanna share with you. So uh, why incorporate as a New York State domestic worker cooperative corporation? Um, uh, as opposed to an LLC or, or an S Corp, which are easier to set up. Um, so, uh, like I said, a, 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 a worker cooperative corporation resembles a corporation. We're all both owners and employees. Uh, so we all get paid a salary. Uh, so that's a W-2 uh, for, for tax purposes um, with, with uh, uh, you know, uh, cash withheld basically uh, for, for taxes. Um, at the end of the year, uh, if we do profit sharing, there's a, the tax form for that is 1099 PATR. There's a separate um, uh, tax form just for cooperative profits. Um, uh, so one of the reasons to do this is we actually can be legally called, uh, this is the only way to legally call yourself a cooperative. Um, the full name of the company is Emma Technology Cooperative. It's not Emma Inc. It's not, you know, it's not Emma Cooperative LLC, which I don't even think would be legal. But to put cooperative in your name, you actually have to be a, a, a recognized cooperative. So insofar as that's something you care about, that's a, requ a requirement. Um, it, we like the fact that we're sort of, it's, ta it's separate from us and that it's, it's, there's this sort of like external uh, uh, entity that shields us from liability, but it's also taxed separately. Um, Finally, it, it makes it harder to stop being a co-op, which is this counterintuitive thing that can happen at some uh, uh, cooperatives. It, it, it's, it happens enough that it has a name. It's called demutualization. Um, if you form, for example, an, an LLC and just put in your bylaws that you want to run yourselves as a co-op, um, you can do that. And like some of the co-ops that we mentioned uh, towards the beginning of the talk are actually incorporated as LLCs, but their bylaws basically just uh, uh, require them to operate on a sort of uh, cooperative basis. Um, that's perfectly valid, but there's nothing stopping a future future members from just rewriting the bylaws. And now the co-op stops being a co-op. The way we set up Emma, if some future version of Emma decided to stop operating as a co-op, they'd lose their tax status. And um, they'd basically run afoul the, you know, the, the government of the state of New York. Um, so we massively disincentivize demutualization by being a cop, and that's something that was important to us. All right, so that's the why a co-op, and then the how a co-op, uh, which is where we start getting into, um, oops, sorry about that, uh, where we start getting into sort of the areas where we had to start fudging things with the government, not fudging them, but you know, working, working within things. Uh, so yeah, we're a New York State domestic worker cooperative corporation. 
um, as opposed to being an LLC, S Corp with co-op bylaws, blah, blah, blah. Um, but one thing that we encountered right away is we had all these goals of not having a hierarchy. And it turns out that New York State absolutely requires every corporation to have a president, a vice president, and a treasurer. Um, we thought we could just be anarchists, but as it turns out, there's these uh, things you have to do. So one of the things we had to do in our bylaws was we had to strip those positions of any and all unique powers. Uh, and we literally chose them by die roll. Uh, and we are going to do that again next year, same way we rotate all our positions. But our bylaws make it clear that they literally don't matter. Um, we still have to do everything through consensus. Uh, we also had to explicitly requ request one class of member. Uh, one class of stock, et cetera, not the default, which is not always obvious to the state or to lawyers. Uh, our bylaws require all employees, owners, managers, officers, directors, shareholders, blah, 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 to be the same person. There is exactly one class of stock and any member can only own at most a single share. Um, so we kind of had to take this system that was designed for more traditional corporations and you can't remove certain things, but you can change the definitions of them enough to work for this kind of other goal. And um, this is the most speculative part, but uh, in terms of tax stuff, because we haven't actually gotten there, uh, federally, we will file an 1120C, which is like an 1120 file, but with extra information for co-ops. So this is where we get the T Corp thing from sub, uh, sub chapter T of the IRS code. Uh, and our understanding is that as a co-op, we do not have a limit on how much money we retain from year to year. We can charge the capacitor as much as we need without raising red flags, which is a much bigger issue at a traditional corporation. So partnerships and S-corps will tax all owners on all profit at the end of the year. C-corps have accumulation limits before red flags go up and extra taxes are incurred. Uh, we have not done this part yet, so we can't comment on it, but talk to us in a year. Uh, and this will be the last like screenshot of a government website uh, in this talk. So now you can go back to just good old, uh, good old formulas and numbers. This is a lot of programmers in the audience, I'm assuming. So, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we, we pay ourselves, we pay our members by commission is, is the way we sort of express it to the state. Uh, we never, we're not required to sort of send them a formula like this, but this is effectively what we are doing as far as the state is concerned. Uh, we have a base salary. You're paid that base salary every month plus a commission. And your commission is 70% of the sales you make. You're making a sale is basically billing a client minus, minus the base salary uh, or zero, right? Uh, the, the largest of the two. Um, so if you make uh, you know, no sales and so you, that, you know, that would be a negative number, your commission is zero. Uh, and if you make in, you know, uh, enough sales such that 70% of them are more than the base salary, then that's what you get paid. The math is the same or the, the end result is the same, but we're sort of, uh, it's structured a little differently with respect to the, to the state. And finally, we can't do all of it on our own as much as we would love to just become experts at everything here. Um, we had to you know, work with a bunch of other people to make this happen. Um, so these include professionals, as lawyers and accountants, uh, as well as services, things like uh, Gusto to run payroll and Brooklyn Co-op where we're banking. So the process of incorporating and maintaining our money just requires people with expertise that we don't have. But by and large, we tried to stick with organizations that align in some way with our values. For the most part, this meant working with other co-ops. Um, so of the folks here, uh, the lawyers, Brooklyn Cooperative, Bookkeeping, like you even see the word co-op a lot on just like the names here. Uh, and now as we know, that means they're officially a co-op. I've learned this. <laughs> um, and working with groups like this, honestly, is a little bit of a mixed bag. There's typically a trade-off in convenience for doing this, but in addition to political goals, they also often have a better, better understanding of what a co-op even is. Um, super important with lawyers, especially, where like there was all this complex stuff that we we're already sort of going against the grain. So if we had lawyers who just like didn't even know what a co-op was really, um, it would be hell. Uh, so one thing we have is, sorry, uh, for our lawyers, uh, it wasn't especially cheap, 
but we knew we couldn't just go to legal zoom like that was a total non-starter so if we wanted this to happen we kind of had to pay to do it right uh, accountants who could handle this sort of stuff were also a little bit difficult to find uh, and then some folks were just booked up also so there was some push and pull there for sure in terms of services we do our payroll with um, something called gusto i would say it's fine it seems to do the job <laughs> Uh, and then we use a command line tool called Ledger to actually keep our books, uh, which Ramsey introduced to us. We've been doing kind of regular sessions with it. Um, and yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's been working so far. And for banking, we are using Brooklyn Cooperative. Uh, we like them because they align with our values. They are a co-op. Um, they can be a little bit tricky because, for instance, they don't have a Swift code. So working with international clients has just been slightly harder. We need an in-between to be able to get money from clients in Canada or other places. Uh, they have no branches, basically. Um, but on the plus side, our banking requirements pretty minimal. We like, don't really need a branch on every week because that's not how we like use money as a co-op. So that's the kind of overall how and the what of how we formed up, but then we get to the fun stuff. Like we did all this work. We like had all these calls with lawyers and had to go to like scary IRS documents on the web. Um, but then we get something out of it. We get the benefits of being a cooperative. And as we've been working together, we found more and more perks of organizing ourselves this way. Even if the capacitor was the main reason we started talking about forming this entity, um, and honestly, for a while, it seemed like the main or only thing we were going to get out of it, which stability is a good thing, like solid cell just on its own right there. Um, but before we were even recognized by the state, we started seeing these other benefits kind of come into play. Uh, and sharing comes up a lot here, which isn't really shocking. It's like we're stronger when we work together or something. So yeah, we just get mutual support. We can help share knowledge. We can help share gigs. We get a stronger negotiating uh, point of view. So let's go through these points just a little bit, although I think a lot of them are like probably kind of obvious. So we're never alone when we're working. Uh, work is difficult. Even if you like your job, even if you feel like you're good at your job, work can just be really hard. And it's really great having a team of people who are not clients, like not directly related to clients to lean on when things are confusing or you need help navigating something, whether it's a technical issue or just like a navigating a corporate structure issue. Um, this is already so much better than working solo, which can feel really isolating when you're like very much by yourself trying to navigate these things. We can also share knowledge. Um, Emma has become a platform for knowledge diffusion across different domains. We're all creative coders, but we all have different skills. Each member of Emma is an expert in something that the others know very little about. Um, the tech support channel in our Mattermost is uh, typically popping off. It is a really useful resource for all of us. Uh, and this is not just to solve immediate problems. There's an ongoing process of just like learning and mentorship that occurs here where we're all upping our game professionally as well as artistically, just learning from each other. Uh, sharing gigs is huge. The sense of like, well, I'm booked right now, but let me talk to my cooperative if someone is offering you uh, something. And this is something we're already inclined to do. I mean, we want to help our friends out. If we can't do a gig and we know someone else would be perfect for it, we want to recommend them. But right now that we're in a co-op, it's even helping each other because if Ramsey's booked and someone offers him a gig and he passes it to me, that's charging the capacitor for Ramsey as well. Um, this has also been really helpful in terms of, yeah, uh, clients often want more than one person working on a project. And so we have other people we can pull in. Um, like right now, we actually are all booked by the same client uh, for at least one gig that we have. Like, yeah, it's like, well, they need someone else. Do you know someone? Sure do. Um, Ivan's metaphor here, we have a lot of Ivan metaphors in this. It's fun. Uh, Ivan's metaphor here is that it's kind of like a barber shop. Uh, you might not get your favorite barber, but you know they're all good. Uh, and from a client perspective too, if they have the choice of bringing someone that they already think we work well with, they're gonna do that. Like the fact that we're all in a co-op implies that we already have an ability to work together effectively and that's attractive. 
And as a group, we have a stronger negotiating stance, uh, which is probably pretty obvious. Um, but there's even kind of small things like asking for money is easier. We've used the kind of generic Emma co-op email to talk to clients or remind someone about a late payment. And it's really effective. The type of things that could feel um, stressful as like a personal uh, confrontation, even if it's not actually a confrontation, can just be like a little bit nerve wracking in a way that a like generic, almost like corporate email is not so much. Um, and of course, is the ability to you know, bounce rates off each other. We're all in the same boat now. So it's an opportunity for all of us to talk to each other and lift each other up and make sure that, you know, we're all getting what's fair. <clears throat> okay. We've made it to the advice portion of the talk. We're actually pretty close to the end. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. It's really fun to talk about this. Um, this is also a little bit of, well, we made some mistakes and maybe you won't have to, um, but just sort of general things we've learned in the time we've been doing this. So we're gonna go really inconsequential to sort of higher concept down this list here. Uh, we got a PO box for Emma, it's kind of annoying. If you're gonna do this, I would consider getting a virtual office. Um, it will probably just make your life a little bit easier. Uh, one side note, if you do get a PO box, uh, remember to pay for it. Uh, one thing that's cool if you are co-op is you can get a .coop URL. We are emma.coop. You can visit emma.coop for all your creative tech needs. Try it today. Um, but the, the, excuse me, the namespace is wide open. You can do all sorts of stuff there. Uh, and it's fun, you have like a doc co op. I don't know, it feels cool. Um, they absolutely check your documents. If you register for a doc co op and you are not a co op, they will shut you down. So be aware of that. Um, we do want to note, just in terms of general advice, that the cooperative structure doesn't guarantee success all on its own. Emma's doing pretty well right now, and we're very happy about that. And we're very happy with the structure we have. Um, but we were all doing fairly well as freelancers even before we started Emma. So, you know, we were able to bring our professional networks in as we got started. And we don't want to give the impression that adopting a cooperative structure is an instant recipe for financial success. Um, unfortunately, you still have to like succeed as a business. And then the last point, which is a really big one, is just the value of regular communication. So we want to take a moment to just talk about how important super regular communication is to us. And this felt like something that we kind of did automatically, maybe it will to you too, but we've actually found as we talk to other people and we read about other co-ops that it's not necessarily the default. Uh, so we want to discuss being in regular communication with collaborators especially because it's something that you can do right now. Um, no state recognition required. Like you could set something up tonight with the people that you collaborate with. So the way we got here is we've been meeting weekly on Slack and occasionally IRL for over a year now. Um, and the sort of platform has even changed over time. Like we just started on Ivan's friend Slack. It was a Slack for like mostly coordinating when to play um, like Valheim, was that that Viking game? Is that a while back? You know what I'm talking about, Splunky 2, <laughs> all these things. We just had a channel and a friend Slack. Uh, and then we started our own Slack. And then we started a Mattermost, which is an open source self-hosted Slack clone. You can imagine that that kind of thing aligns with our values. And so we like it. But no matter what, we had a way to communicate regularly. And then we also did video calls or occasionally IRL meetings once a week. And these were just work accountability meetings. 90% of these meetings were just, hey, what are you working on this week? What are you trying to get done this week? Um, which is what we do. I mean, we had one of these yesterday where we all just like go around the table and talk about what we're doing this week and what we want to get done. And it helps get those things done. But of course, at the same time, that becomes an opportunity to share information about gigs. We started building solidarity way, way before we were actually recognized as a co-op. Um, and this also meant that members with more privilege who were um, charging higher rates could lift each other up. Um, turns out a lot of folks who maybe don't look exactly like me were sometimes being paid less than they ought to. And it's really great to have a space to be able to talk about those things and like, you know, give other people that advantage and like try to pull them up. Um, we were developing the mind space of a co-op before we were legally a co-op. Uh, I don't know if you want to hop in with another hashtag theory here. 
yeah uh, anarchists call that prefiguration so <laughs> i'm here for all your hashtag theory needs uh, we're kind of joking, but I'm honestly so lucky to like be building a structure with someone like Ramsey who like does this kind of work. Uh, I'm a huge beneficiary of this. <laughs> so we're talking about, you know, all these very important things that are useful in its own right. And we also were building the habit of normal meetings. So we just got used to meeting every week. We got used to discussing things um, in Slack or now Mattermost pretty frequently. And this helped when we needed to add other meetings to what we're doing. Like we wanna rotate responsibilities for things. Uh, and so like running payroll is complex. It's a tricky thing. So we started doing finance Fridays where we hop on a call together and one person runs the payroll, everyone else watches and like helps out. Uh, and we all learn how to do a thing. And it wasn't weird to add that into the mix because we're already in the habit of having these kind of meetings. And of course, these meeting places kind of act like a water cooler. Um, we can vent about gigs, support each other. Um, the benefits here are both professional and mental health. And it's important to be doing this in a space where, um, you know, we don't have clients involved. It's not like in a client Slack where like that would obviously be a bad idea. It's a space where we can speak a little freely and make sure that everyone is able to like, you know, really get their stuff done in a way that makes sense for them. All right. That's just about the end of our talk. Uh, we kind of went through what we wanted personally to how we did it to what we're getting out of this now. Um, and we'll be more than happy to take some questions. I know we're running maybe a little over. Uh, we did want to throw up a few resources for you. So you can check institute.coop, democracy at work, resources on forming and running a co-op. Um, you should really check out the field train operating agreement uh, if you're interested in it. Uh, I swear these, it's extremely human readable. The annotations on it make it super, super accessible. It's an interesting thing to read, even if you're not planning on starting a co-op. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we're hoping to share our own documents in a similar way at some point in the future. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you to NYU for hosting. Thank you, Maddie, for emailing us about this. Logan, for getting this set up. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, I'm Rabbi, for doing the captions. Thank you so much. Uh, we have some emails here. We have Twitter. We've got Instagram. We've got our emails. Just uh, the, the whole shebang here. <laughs> yeah, we, we timed our social media reveal with this talk which on Twitter turned out to be uh, a little bit unfortunate, but what can you do? <laughs> well, great timing. Thank you all for your talk. So if everyone can please give a round of applause, both physically and digitally, that is amazing. Thank you. Um, awesome. So I feel like we have, we do have some time for questions. So um, everyone please filter questions through the appropriate authorities uh, and they will get to me. Um, somehow. And so I'm going to just start off with a question that I'm interested in because I'm the host. So I get to do that. Um, so I guess the thing for me is like, I'm really interested in kind of, uh, so first of all, thank you all for just a very practical talk for people and students who are just like, they really want to do this. They're, the energy for this is really there. Like, I think just like 2022 is going to be like the year of like, divorces and co-ops that's like my prediction and so I feel like everyone is like really into like how to do this but it's really hard because you kind of see people doing it but you don't know how to do it yourself yeah. and so this is such an amazing resource and I really appreciate it especially coming from a creative technology standpoint because our culture is a little different than other than other cultures so like you know, like people who decide to make a grocery store, right, is a little bit different than those who want to make, you know, a creative technology place. So um, I guess the thing that I'm kind of interested in is, um, is kind of like uh, my favorite aspect of what you all are talking about is this desire for many co-ops to exist and to exist with each other and work with the sort of like, you know, um, I think you all phrased it as a syndicate to federation level right um and i'm kind of interested to maybe i know this is a like super big picture um but i think maybe having the ideal really you know out in front is like might be useful for energizing people how do you all see that like kind of um either um like what what do you think what sort of aims do you all see 
like creative technology workers, so games to, you know, tech in general, what sort of like benefits do you see from like moving to that like sort of function? And I actually, I'm going to actually do incorporate this idea of like, let's say our social spaces is becoming owned by the richest person on the planet, given like a context like that, right? Like how important or what sort of benefits do you all see like us starting to become like syndicated and federated in our pro in our sort of field. So I would just, I know that's a huge thing, but I would just love like a kind of idealistic, you know, what are your ideals? Um, I mean, for me, the like a key benefit um, is the ability to, when you're that granular at the lowest level, um, you could start to tailor each, I mean, when we're talking about co-ops, the fact that each co-op can tailor itself to its members, I think is like the really big sort of transformation that that, that, that model affords. Um, and when, when, you, when you sort of map that onto something like social networks, um, I mean, it's not even theoretical, right? We have Mastodon and, and Twitter and Mastodon is, is federated and sort of approximates a kind of like syndicated, uh, I mean, it's really just the one level, right? But it, it is a federated structure. And then you have Twitter and Twitter is a one size fits, it sort of has to be a one size fits all solution because it's trying to be one giant thing. Um, and that means it's gonna leave people out, right? Like whenever you make an abstraction, you're sort of necessarily excluding uh, aspects that don't fit that abstraction. So, uh, but, but on Mastodon instances can tailor themselves to their, their members and, and many instances, they're, they're very, very different, but they're all able to sort of communicate with each other because they federate. So that to me is the big, the big benefit, right? Is that you can start to have communities and, and workplaces tailor things to their own needs. Uh, so being very, very local while continuing to collaborate with each other to achieve like bigger goals. Cool, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything, Andy. No, no, no. I'm I'm with Ramsey on this one. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> and so I, but I also kind of want to also bring in this idea of like, this is like very specific kind of labor that we do. And also there's just a very specific sort of context. So for instance, like you all, um, I, I don't, uh, I don't know if I want to say it's in your bylaws, but in your values is you are making art, right? And that making art and the ability to make art without making money from art or being forced to make money from art is a very central value to you all. So in a sense, it kind of feels like being artists is kind of one of the main impetuses of like doing this whole entire thing. And so I guess um, I would be kind of interested to kind of hear from you all, like your experiences in trying to navigate, let's say tech and games art spaces, like for maybe people who don't know as well as we, I know, yeah, as people who don't know as well as we do, right? Like, um, what ex like, why exactly is it so, like, where do we get into the thorns to the point where we would want to do something alternative like this? That says, like, you know, uh, you know, there's always this sort of um, narrative that, like, um, that is pushed, like, you should make all your money from your art, right? That's kind of, like, that's the narrative that's kind of sent out to you. So, like, when is the moment you all started to realize that you didn't have to make money from your art and that art was taking another place in your life that led to something like this? I, I have like almost like one exact moment that really solidified that, <laughs> uh, which is uh, Ben Johnson um, was mm -hmm. hosting, I want to say it was the Horse Ebooks Jam. <laughs> like a game okay. gym years ago, everyone chose like Horse Ebooks features. I don't even know if, if Ben was... Um, like giving a, a whole speech or if he was just talking or whatever, but he'd been making games with baby castles and things, uh, games that just like, you know, like Mega Gurp were like super, super fun and like good luck selling something like Mega Gurp. <laughs> um, like obviously they, that was never the goal. No one was trying to sell Mega Gurp. Um, but he was talking uh, at this like Game Jam intro about how vibrant the New York scene was and that it was like all these people doing really interesting stuff with games in New York and that part of what made the output so interesting is that no one could make a living making games in New York. It's just like it wasn't possible. So people weren't trying <laughs> so much. And as a result, the work that came out of it had a lot more freedom. <laughs> and I remember just that moment of being like, oh yeah, that's, 
that's wild. You can just do stuff because it's cool, because you like <laughs> it, like, because it makes something interesting happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, so, so to frame what I'm about to say, it's like, it's a massive privilege, right, to have programming and software development as, a, as an option. Um, as an alternative way to, uh, as a not, uh, you know, as a way to make a living, and programming in a way that's very near my art practice, right? So I, I acknowledge that. Um, but I, uh, many of my friends were very, very successful video game developers, right? And they did the thing, and they like, so like made games that were both aesthetically and mechanically interesting, um, but also like met market needs. And I guess for me, one of the the moment of departure was actually quite a while ago, probably around grad school, when I realized that it was really hard to make an experience that was interesting and compelling for a person. Like that was a puzzle. And then there was this other puzzle of how do you meet market needs? Mm. And those are just, they're orthogonal, right? They're sort of unrelated puzzles. It, it's almost like, you know, if I'm in the middle of like tying my shoes, someone asking me to do my taxes. It's like, that's another... <laughs> It's another thing. Like, I don't want to be doing two things at once. And some people really are good at reconciling those two things. I just realized that I'm bad at that. And it's not really something that I want to focus on. Absolutely. Uh, there's a reason I'm teaching. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So a couple of audience questions. I'm going to kind of take a couple of things and just mish them together um, to kind of get at the spirit of what I'm hearing. So one, um, one theme I'm seeing are kind of questions here is this idea of, uh, is like the moment in which, let's say someone it needs help in some way, let's say when one member is like, let's say sick or has particular needs that requires like usually insurance and things like that. And also this idea of like how support, like what is the support that is like, like kind of completely within the co-op and what is it kind of, and how is this relationship to support networks outside of the co-op, right? Which is like our lives, our friendships, or even our, our peers or our communities. And so I kind of want to hear um, just a little bit of like kind of what you, I, I don't, you don't have to like talk about an actual like, like instance, since that might be personal, but like, how do you all en envision like um, encountering something like that, like if someone was like seriously ill and like the kind of things that need to happen for support. Yeah, I, I mean, this is part of um, this, the idea of scale, right? Um, we all know each other and we all are we're small enough that we know each other um, personally. Uh, you know, some of us met just through Emma. Some of us knew each other before Emma. But at this point, we all know each other, and and there's certainly a kind of, um, I think, an, an emotional support that like the, the car provides. Uh, I've never, um, it's never been a medical thing for me, but I've certainly went through. Um, I, or Emma has been very useful for me to like think out loud about certain big decisions that I might want to make professionally, um, which is sort of not in the like bylaws or anything. It's it's not in the like anything we talked about in this talk, but just having, uh, I guess it's, it's the, 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 the point about communication, right? It's just having a place to go uh, and like talk to people who like, you know, give a shit basically yeah. about you. Um, I, I, which, is, which is minor, but I, you know, most workplaces are, are just not that. Uh, and they kind of can't do that. And, and I would also just speak to like, oh, someone can't work for a while. Um, that's sort of what the capacitor is for. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of like super long-term things that someone's work just like isn't really good for a while, we have some systems in place where like it starts as a conversation. It's not like we have a thing where like, if you don't bring in this much for three years, you are out. Um, but like we have, you know, in the bios, we had to put some stuff in there about like, oh, there's conditions under which we might have to discuss um, needing a member to leave. But mm -hmm. that's because like work has like, you know, their actual work has dropped off, not because they are sick or something um because i know the other members of the co-op do good work and it's on like a strictly utilitarian thing which isn't even how we're looking at it but it's worth it for me to have them be floated by the co-op because when they're ready to come back i know they're good yeah. i know they do good work mm -hmm. um and also just like as a person i want to support them 
but <laughs> right. even uh, besides that structure, I have a really good reason to want to make sure that they get the support they need. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, some other um, kind of um, maybe a little bit more um, brass tack sort of things, but like um, what kind of um, like, like uh, skill set sort of harmonies have you all seen in other sort of like either your own and other co-ops that like you see as kind of like, um, or, or like as either as like a, um, as a good benefit, or do you kind of think that like, there isn't really a set amount of like, like skills that need to be shared or, or, or present in a co-op in order for it to feel successful in this particular, like art tech or tech space. So like, just from your perspective, like, is this sort of like a, do like must people be strategic about the particular kind of skills that everyone is being brought to the table was that part of the conversation when you started emma um and if so like what sort of skills do you all feel like for your line of work is pretty much essential i i, I don't think we kind of sat down to be like okay you're you're the shader person you're the <laughs> compiler person you're the games person mm -hmm. um we started doing this because we're all doing pretty similar work truth be told, um, I would say like probably about 50% of the gigs we get like any member of Emma could do. Mm -hmm. So no, I don't think we were like trying to like make like a perfect, uh, perfectly meshed team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the bigger thing is that since we had quite a bit of overlap, we had a common place where we could all come from and then we could sort of bring additional skills to it. There's also the skills that go into the boring parts, the like the books and, <laughs> and, and all that that's all learnable like honestly like that's that's all um that's stuff we all picked up doing this like none yeah. of us like none of us was an accountant coming into this none of us um i mean i think we've all been involved in companies and stuff but um yeah so th so those are all t totally I, I mean in my experience is that they're they're those are skills that are acquirable um, but I mean, we also, we certainly had members who came in with specific skills that really helped us get off the ground. I mean, Gwen is just, um, oh, yeah. she's really good at server stuff. Like she can keep things running and keep them <laughs> effective. And so like our Mattermost, like Gwen set it up. There's a lot of stuff that Gwen has set up because she had those skills. Uh, Ivan has previous experience living in cooperative housing. So when we were discussing like how we're going to set things up, he had a really useful lens to come at it from. Yeah. <laughs> so even outside of the like professional skills, I'd say a lot of our members have skills that really helped us get off the ground. Absolutely. And I want to stress how important it is to not only think of cooperatives as like, um, like kind of like a corporate alternative entities, but also lifestyle decisions, right? And kind of how that affects, affects things, which I think sometimes can be um, overlooked. So I'm glad that you brought that up. And just kind of as a, a sort of um, bringing it back to kind of like art and things. Um, so something that some, maybe some of our students or maybe all, some of us are aware are aware of when you work for a company, often they are very controlling of when you get to work and do things and whether they get to own the work you get to do and like how like different kinds of like um, how like kind of how you working outside of the company affects the company like what is y'all's relationship to that right like what is like yeah i know not my question but like i but it is important to know if anything just to show the difference between going to work for like nintendo and then like you know and, and then their ideas of like what you what you should be doing in and out of work and then like somewhere like like emma right like what would be your relationship to that sort of stuff so so i could answer that on a like a uh, this is on a theoretical level and then a concrete level, like what we do. Mm -hmm. um, so theoretically, when you're in a corporation um, uh, or under capitalism, there are employers and there are employees and the different kinds of people. Um, and when you work at Nintendo, you have an employer who owns the company and they decide, there may be a, a, a board that votes. It may be one asshole who buys a website, you know, whoever owns the thing basically decides what you own, what you don't own, what you can do outside of the company. And it's, it's literally none of your business, right? You sort of take it or leave it. Um, a co-op, that's the main theoretical difference, right? Is that there are not employers and employees, there are, there are members, right? And, and we flatten that relationship out. 
Um, so the, the sort of high level answer is it's whatever you all want it to be, right? Like if you decide that whenever, like we could have decided that like if any of us makes money selling a game on their own, 10% of that goes into Emma. That's, mm -hmm. we're entitled to do that, right? That's, that's not something we decided. Um, but that's, that's the thrill of, of co-ops. It's like you make it what you want it to be with the people that, you, that you're working with. Um, currently, we don't, I mean, you know, if people make stuff on the side, it's their own and we make no claim to it. Um, and yeah, the way people sort of act on their own is like also, if it becomes an issue, it'll, we'll bring it up at a meeting, but like the, we have no policies currently towards any of that. I mean, that's one of the nice things about a small group is um, there's a lot of things that don't necessarily need policies because we're small enough that we can have conversations. It's not that like, oh, we're so small and know each other so well that no one will ever do anything bad. Right. More just that like, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it and maybe tell them like, you need to cut that out. But <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, just to, to quickly answer the other thing, you, asked, you did say something about like ownership. And just to be clear, I would say 99% of the gigs we do we're just writing code for a client. Like the client owns the thing. We do our stuff, we're gone, they, they own it. Um, that's typically the nature of this kind of work. Cool. Well, thank you all again. We're at time, but I just want to do another round of applause for you all. Thank you all so much. This is amazing. I really appreciated that you all came and did this with us. So I just have to do the quick, um, I was supposed to thank some sponsors, which I did not do. So thanks for uh, Fresh Planet, Take Two Interactive, Empire State Development, and Parsec, but also Mirror by Night for the lovely captions. Thank you so much. And so that's a wrap, y'all. Thank you again. And there should be um, a live recording posted some other time if you all want to watch it. Yeah. But that's a wrap from us. Thank you. Thanks thank you so much. Us. This has been really lovely. <laughs>